Alright, so today I want to talk about the transonic zone. What is the transonic zone? It's the red-headed stepchild of long-range precision shooting. Um, the transonic zone is defined by the area right above and right below Mach 1. What is Mach 1? Mach 1 is the speed of sound. How fast is the speed of sound? 1125 feet per second or 767 miles per hour. So that is Mach 1. Mach 1 is when you break the sound barrier, meaning that you are traveling at the exact same speed of sound. If you ever look up and see a, you ever hear a fighter jet go overhead, depending on where you live or wherever you've been, um, and you hear it above you, but you look and it's not there, and you look way ahead of it and it's way down the sky, that's because that fighter jet is traveling above 600 or 767 miles an hour, well above the speed of sound. A bullet, when you fire it, travels, or depending on what bullet, what caliber, all the things, muzzle velocity, all these things, is especially the bullets that we're talking about for long range precision shooting are generally well above Mach 2. Usually, almost to Mach 3, sometimes even to Mach 3. So the transonic zone is defined by Mach 1.2 to Mach 0.8. So right above and right below, around 1,350 feet per second, somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on air pressure, um, elevation, height above sea level, all that, down to around 900 feet per second. So that, that area, when the bullet is within those speeds, is called the transonic zone. So why does the transonic zone matter? I know if you, if you hear people talking about long range shooting and they talk about shooting out really far, they talk about their bullet going transonic and subsonic, um, that sounds great, but what is it? So that's what we're going to talk about. So that's that area, Mach 1.2 to Mach 0.8, the transonic zone, is the area where your shock wave created by the bullet that is traveling above the speed of sound. Any anytime something breaks the sound barrier, it makes a sonic boom and a sonic shock wave that travels behind it. So that's why when you see somebody doing long range videos, a lot of times in my long range videos, you'll see what's called bullet trace. That bullet trace that you're seeing is actually the shock wave of the bullet as it travels through the air, um, displacing the air around it. Um, if you ever seen pictures of a fighter jet as it breaks the sound barrier, you'll see a big white, oddly colored cloud almost around it. Um, that is actually a picture of the jet breaking the sound barrier. Um, the transonic zone, when your bullet is in that transonic zone, it is right in the area where the that shock wave is just barely present. So the, what happens when that shock wave is barely present is it is not even. So when your bullet is traveling above the speed of sound, so supersonic, and when your bullet is traveling below the speed of sound, there is nothing There is nothing to disrupt that flight. So bullets will travel smoothly as long as they stay above the speed of sound, and they will travel smoothly as long as they go stay below the speed of sound. And there are some types of bullets that transition between the two very well, in transition through the transonic zone. But when you have the wrong type of bullet, it can start to yaw, start to veer um, and do all kinds of crazy things and can open up your groups, even make it so that you miss your target by many, many feet um, when a bullet does not transition smoothly through the transonic zone. So when that, when your protective cone is what, like what I call it, um, I did a, a video a while back, um, uh, can you shoot uh, long range precision in the rain or something to that effect, something like that. I can't remember the exact name of it. But in that video, I explain how that shock wave created by the bullet basically makes a protective cone around the bullet as long as the bullet is traveling supersonic. And actually, no rain, even though you're shooting through the rain, no matter how thick that rain is, no rain is actually touching that bullet to knock it off its trajectory. 
So when the bullet comes into that 1,350 feet per second and below until it gets to that around 900 feet per second, that shock wave is, is not stable. So because that shock wave is not stable, sometimes it's heavier on the top or right at the sides, wherever, all around that bullet. Sometimes it's more prevalent in one side or the other, and that will cause it to push on the bullet in one way or the other and cause the bullet to yaw, um, veer very, very violently. Um, and I have even heard, but have never honestly, I, I will not say that the bullet will tumble, even though I have heard many stories, I'm sure people have seen this, I just have personally never seen evidence of a bullet, even even a bullet that I know did not make that transition smoothly. Um, I've never seen evidence on the target, in the ground, anywhere around of the bullet actually tumbling. I've seen much, many evidence of the group opening up drastically, I've seen much evidence of the bullets veering wildly off course, but I've never seen evidence of a bullet actually tumbling. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I've heard many people say that it does, and I'm sure it probably does. So that transonic zone, that, like I said, Mach 1.1 1, Mach 1 .1 to 0.8, um, that is the area where your bullet is very unstable or can become very unstable in its flight. Um, that is a place, as a matter of fact, like commercial airliners travel under Mach point, under Mach point eight. Um, the reason they do that is because they become just like a bullet, a commercial airliner or any any aircraft can become very unstable in that transonic zone. Um, it does the same, it has the same effect on anything that's traveling through the air just like it does your bullet. Um, that's the same reason that when you see those fighter jets go by and they're traveling well above the speed of sound, you don't ever see them traveling just barely above the speed of sound. Um, and when they, when they speed through that, they do it very quickly because they have the same issues of it being becoming very unstable on their aircraft. So transonic zone is not just a a pain for bullets and long-range shooting it is a pain for many other things so how do we shoot through the transonic zone and remain keep our bullet remaining stable so there's different types of bullets act differently going through the transonic zone one thing that really affects how a bullet transitions through a tr through, through the transonic barrier is your twist rate so if you have a bullet that has a Plenty, it has plenty of twist um, as it gets to the transonic zone, transonic barrier. When it gets to that point, as long as it still has plenty of twist, it has plenty of stability factor. The stability factor is still plenty high um, and can help it carry itself through the transonic barrier um, without becoming disrupted or without becoming extremely disrupted. Um, also, bullet type really matters in this aspect. Um, and it's so hard to predict a bullet that is going to transition well through the transonic barrier. So the old 4570 governments, um, the big, bulbous tipped, short, fat little bullet, those things were known and, and do transition through transonic very well. They start off, usually depending on rifle and everything, they are usually fired right above transonic and have no problem transitioning through. And it's just because of the shape of that bullet. Shorter, fatter bullets tend to transition through the transonic zone better than Spitzer style bullets like we shoot in long range precision. So how do you pick a long range precision bullet that is going to transition through the transonic zone? And you may also ask, why do I care? This is only for people who shoot ELR distances or that are going to shoot out really far. And that's not always the case. Um, some of the rounds that you shoot may become transonic well before you realize it. So say the, the 6.5 Grindel that I shoot, um, it's transonic starts well before a thousand yards. Most 308s start well before a thousand yards. As a matter of fact, when you hear somebody say the effective range of a cartridge, usually that coincides with the transonic zone. So if you hear somebody say 308 has an 800 yard effective range, that's typically because whatever bullet, whatever load they're shooting hits the transonic barrier around 800 yards. So, and they cannot 
with 100% certainty say whatever load they're shooting is going to make that transition smoothly. So that's why we have to pick a bullet that is going to transition smoothly through that because many of you, if you're shooting long range, want to shoot, even if you're shooting a 308, tend to want to shoot past 800 yards. I don't blame you. I, I rarely shoot less than 800 yards when I'm shooting my long range oh. shot. Like I said, the bullets that maintain stability easiest through the transonic barrier are typically bullets that are shorter and fatter bullets. But the problem with that is, is the shorter, fatter bullets have, you typically, or almost always, have a lower ballistic coefficient than the long, skinny, heavy for caliber bullets that we shoot for long range precision. So finding a bullet that is going to tra make that transition smoothly is sometimes very difficult. Really? There's really only one way to know for sure if your bullet is going to make that transition smoothly and that is to shoot to transonic and beyond into subsonic. Um, like I said, there are the shorter, fatter bullets tend to make that transition more smoothly, but they are not the type of bullets that we tend to want to shoot for long range precision. Now, say you could pick a 105 grain bullet in your six millimeter um, over say a 110 grain bullet or 115 and that in theory should make that transition smoother, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the bullets that you expect to shoot the worst through transonic shoot the best. I mean, there's really just no way to tell. I'm sure there is somebody with a big brain who can tell you and, and knows better math than I do that can tell you how a bullet is going to transition and what, what kind of uh, properties make that bullet better for transitioning through the transonic barrier. But I have yet to meet that person and I still to this day don't know anybody that can explain it perfectly. Um, like I said, there's a couple of things you can do to have better luck going through transonic. One is have a bullet with, that is spinning fast enough to maintain its stability factor when it gets there and that will usually help it transition through transonic. Um, and typically most bullets that you're going to shoot for long range precision, most of the bullets that are out on the market nowadays, most of these bullets here will at least somewhat smoothly transition through transonic. But every once in a while you get that load that just shoots fantastic and hits the transonic barrier and absolutely falls apart. So like I said, the only way to know for sure is to shoot through that. Like I said, if you keep a bullet with a higher stability factor, that can help. But beyond that, that is the only tip that I know to help transition through it. So just wanted a quick video here to give you guys something that you guys may not have been aware of. Um, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard people talk about transonic, subsonic, supersonic, but uh, may not have known exactly what it was and how it works and why, why it does what it does. So that's what this is. I hope this helps you guys. I'll see you guys next time. I'm out.